Let us turn our attention now to environment. As we have already seen, we absorb the material for thought from our surrounding environment. The term environment covers a very broad field. It consists of the books we read, the people with whom we associate, the community in which we live, the nature of the work in which we are engaged, the country or nation in which we reside, the clothes we wear, the songs we sing, and, most important of all, the religious and intellectual training we receive prior to the age of fourteen years. The purpose of analyzing the subject of environment is to show its direct relationship to the personality we are developing, and the importance of so guarding it that its influence will give us the materials out of which we may attain our definite chief aim in life. The mind feeds upon that which we supply it, or that which is forced upon it, through our environment. Therefore, let us select our environment as far as possible with the object of supplying the mind with suitable material out of which to carry on its work of attaining our definite chief aim. If your environment is not to your liking, change it. The first step is to create in your own mind an exact, clear, and well-rounded out picture of the environment in which you believe you could best attain your definite chief aim. And then, concentrate your mind upon this picture until you transform it into reality. In Lesson 2 of this course, you learn that the first step you must take in the accomplishment of any desire is to create in your mind a clear, well-defined picture of that which you intended to accomplish. This is the first principle to be observed in your plans for the achievement of success, and if you fail or neglect to observe it, you cannot succeed, except by chance. Your daily associates constitute one of the most important and influential parts of your environment, and may work for your progress or your retrogression according to the nature of those associates. As far as possible, you should select as your most intimate daily associates those who are in sympathy with your aims and ideals, especially those represented by your definite chief aim, and whose mental attitude inspires you with enthusiasm, self-confidence, determination, and ambition. Remember that every word spoken within your hearing Every sight that reaches your eyes, and every sense impression that you receive through any of the five senses, influences your thought as surely as the sun rises in the east and sets in the west. This being true, can you not see the importance of controlling as far as possible the environment in which you live and work? Can you not see the importance of reading books that deal with subjects which are directly related to your definite chief aim? Can you not see the importance of talking with people who are in sympathy with your aims, and who will encourage you and spur you on toward their attainment? We are living in what we call a twentieth-century civilization. The leading scientists of the world are agreed that nature has been millions of years in creating, through the process of evolution, our present civilized environment. How many hundreds of centuries the so-called Indians had lived upon the North American continent? Without any appreciable advance toward modern civilization, as we understand it, we have no way of ascertaining. Their environment was the wilderness, and they made no attempt whatsoever to change or improve that environment. The change took place only after new races from afar came over and forced upon them the environment of progressive civilization in which we are living today. Observe what has happened within the short period of three centuries. Hunting grounds have been transformed into great cities, and the Indian has taken on education and culture in many instances that equal the accomplishment of his white brothers. In Lesson 15, we discuss the effects of environment from a worldwide viewpoint and describe in detail the principle of social heredity, which is the chief source through which the effects of environment may be imposed upon the minds of the young. The clothes you wear influence you. Therefore, they constitute a part of your environment. Soiled or shabby clothes depress you and lower your self-confidence, while clean clothes, of an appropriate style, have just the opposite effect. It is a well-known fact that an observant person can accurately analyze a man by seeing his workbench, desk, or other place of employment. A well-organized desk indicates a well-organized brain. Show me the merchant's stock of goods and I will tell you whether he has an organized or disorganized brain as there is a close relationship between one's mental attitude and one's physical environment. The effects of environment so vitally influence those who work in factories, stores, and offices 
that employers are gradually realizing the importance of creating an environment that inspires and encourages the workers. One unusually progressive laundryman in the city of Chicago has plainly outdone his competitors by installing in his workroom a player piano, in charge of a neatly dressed young woman who keeps it going during the working hours. His laundry women are dressed in white uniforms, and there is no evidence about the place that work is drudgery. Through the aid of this pleasant environment, this laundryman turns out more work, earns more profits, and pays better wages than his competitors can pay. This brings us to an appropriate place at which to describe the method through which you may apply the principles directly and indirectly related to the subject of concentration. Let us call this method the magic key to success. In presenting you with this magic key, let me first explain that it is no invention or discovery of mine. It is the same key that is used in one form or another by the followers of New Thought and all other sects which are founded upon the positive philosophy of optimism. This magic key constitutes an irresistible power which all who will may use. It will unlock the door to riches, it will unlock the door to fame, and in many instances, it will unlock the door to physical health. It will unlock the door to education and let you into the storehouse of all your latent ability. It will act as a pass key to any position in life for which you are fitted. Through the aid of this magic key, we have unlocked the secret doors to all of the world's great inventions. Through its magic powers, all of our great geniuses of the past have been developed. Suppose you are a laborer in a menial position and desire a better place in life. The magic key will help you attain it. Through its use, Carnegie, Rockefeller, Hill, Harriman, Morgan, and scores of others of their type have accumulated vast fortunes of material wealth. It will unlock prison doors and turn human derelicts into useful, trustworthy human beings. It will turn failure into success and misery into happiness. You ask? What is this magic key? And I answer with one word. Concentration. Now, let me define concentration in the sense that it is here used. First, I wish to be clearly understood that I have no reference to occultism, although I will admit that all the scientists of the world have failed to explain the strange phenomena produced through the aid of concentration. Concentration, in the sense in which it is here used, means the ability, through fixed habit and practice, to keep your mind on one subject until you have thoroughly familiarized yourself with that subject and mastered it. It means the ability to control your attention and focus it on a given problem until you have solved it. It means the ability to throw off the effects of habits which you wish to discard and the power to build new habits that are more to your liking. It means complete self-mastery. Stating it in another way, concentration is the ability to think as you wish to think, the ability to control your thoughts and direct them to a definite end, and the ability to organize your knowledge into a plan of action that is sound and workable. You can readily see that in concentrating your mind upon your definite chief aim in life, you must cover many closely related subjects which blend into each other and complete the main subject upon which you are concentrating. Ambition and desire are the chief factors which enter into the act of successful concentration. Without these factors, the magic key is useless, and the main reason why so few people make use of this key is that most people lack ambition and desire nothing in particular. Desire whatever you may, and if your desire is within reason, and if it is strong enough, the magic key of concentration will help you attain it. There are learned men of science who would have us believe that the wonderful power of prayer operates through the principle of concentration on the attainment of a deeply seated desire. Nothing was ever created by a human being which was not first created in the imagination, through desire, and then transformed into reality through concentration. Now, let us put the magic key to a test through the aid of a definite formula. First, you must put your foot on the neck of skepticism and doubt. No unbeliever ever enjoyed the benefits of this magic key. You must believe in the test that you are about to make. We will assume that you have thought something about becoming a successful writer, or a powerful public speaker, or a successful business executive, or an able financier. 
We will take public speaking as the subject of this test, but remember that you must follow instructions to the letter. Take a plain sheet of paper, ordinary letter size, and write on it the following. I am going to become a powerful public speaker because this will enable me to render the world useful service that is needed, and because it will yield me a financial return that will provide me with the necessary material things of life. I will concentrate my mind upon this desire for ten minutes daily, just before retiring at night and just after arising in the morning, for the purpose of determining just how I shall proceed to transform it into reality. I know that I can become a powerful and magnetic speaker, therefore I will permit nothing to interfere with my doing so. Signed. Sign this pledge, then proceed to do as you have pledged your word that you would do. Keep it up until the desired results have been realized. Now, when you come to do your concentrating, this is the way to go about it. Look ahead one, three, five, or even ten years, and see yourself as the most powerful speaker of your time. See, in your imagination, an appropriate income. See yourself in your own home that you have purchased with the proceeds from your efforts as a speaker or lecturer. See yourself in possession of a nice bank account as a reserve for old age. See yourself as a person of influence due to your great ability as a public speaker. See yourself engaged in a life calling in which you will not fear the loss of your position. Paint this picture clearly through the powers of your imagination, and lo, it will soon become transformed into a beautiful picture of deeply seated desire. Use this desire as the chief object of your concentration and observe what happens.